10 de octubre de 1982, the 10th of October 1982, St. Peter's Square is packed with people. More than 200,000 believers gathered for this ceremony, the canonization of Maximilian Mary Kolbe, the Polish Franciscan, slave of the Immaculate, tireless apostle of the Virgin Mary, a fire with zeal for the salvation of souls, who even in sickness and physical limitations, suffering from tuberculosis, was a missionary in India, in Japan. In Poland, he created an entire city in honor of the Immaculate, Neopokulanao. From there, with his more than 800 friars, he propagated knowledge of faith in the Most Blessed Virgin, Mother of God, the Immaculate, as intercessor of all graces. In that ceremony of the 10th of October 1982, there was a certain sense of expectation because Maximilian Kolbe had been beatified as confessor of the faith, but some were expecting that there might be a change. When the ceremony commenced, St. John Paul II, also Polish, appeared in red vestments, visible proof that the Apostle of the Immaculate the slave of the Immaculate would be canonized as a martyr of charity in imitation of Jesus Christ. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. His parents were poor weavers. They designed items of clothing as a livelihood, selling them to Jewish merchants. His mother was a deeply religious woman. In fact, she once wished to enter a convent, but it was impossible due to her family's economic situation. They were unable to pay the dowry then demanded by convents, so she got married. But she asked of God the grace to find a husband who did not swear, who did not drink alcohol in the taverns. And God granted her the grace to meet a good man who was deeply religious like her, Julian Colby. They had five sons, but of the five, two died at an early age, and three survived. Francis, Joseph, and the saint who is the protagonist of our story, Raymond, who would later take the religious name of Maximilian. One of the best known episodes in the life of St. Maximilian Kolbe is the dream he had as a, a small child. And in this dream, he saw the Blessed Virgin Mary approaching him, holding two crowns. The first was the crown of martyrdom, and the other was the crown of purity. And she asked him which of the two he would have. And audaciously, he asked for both of them. His family moved to a town called Pabianice, close to Lodz. And while there, some Franciscan friars crossed the Russian border to preach a mission in the town parish. They told the children about a school the Franciscans had just opened in Lwov. Our Raymond immediately wanted to go there, and his brother Francisco too. Arrangements were made, and as he grew up in that school, he gave thought to the idea of a vocation, although he felt deeply drawn to the military life. This was the great temptation in discerning his vocation. He had a very good mind for mathematics, physics, and the sciences. In fact, for homework projects, he designed aircrafts. He even drew up a strategy to conquer the city of Warsaw. And these military desires, as I say, were a great temptation. He came close to abandoning his vocation because at the age of 15, 
He felt the call to fight for the freedom of his country, of a Poland that was suffering greatly. Poland had practically been wiped out since the Peace Treaty of Vienna, in which it was distributed between Prussia, Austria, and Russia. And it was the Catholic Church that maintained the Catholic identity against the process of Russianization. The enemies of the Church wished to attack Poland, which was the primary objective in the Second World War. And the day that he had decided to go and speak with the provincial father, as he was entering the room, the doorbell rang. It turned out to be his mother, who had come to visit him. His mother informed him that his younger brother, Francisco, had also decided to become a Franciscan, and that she herself and his father would also consecrate themselves to God. So that conversation was providential, and it saved the religious and Franciscan vocation of Raymond who on the 4th of October of 1904 received the Franciscan habit and took the name of Maximilian Mary, binding himself thus from the beginning of his life to the Blessed Virgin, the Immaculate. Once he had completed the novitiate, the provincial father wished him to continue his studies in philosophy in Rome. His first reaction was to ask with tears to be removed from the list, but after praying a while, he returns to the provincial to say to him, Do with me as you wish. To which the provincial responded, You will go to Rome. He lives in Rome from 1912, approximately, until 1919. There, he receives entire formation for the priesthood. In 1914, he makes his solemn profession of vows. The Roman period was fundamental for Maximilian because it provided the basis for all that came afterwards. During his time in Rome, Colby begins to suffer the first symptoms of his sickness, frequently coughing blood and violent hemorrhages, sure signs of tuberculosis. But thanks to his firmness of character, he manages to continue his studies, and he begins to experience the first callings to found the Militia of the Immaculate. With the permission of the rector, we would gather in secret in a locked cell before a small statue of the Immaculate with two lighted candles. Dispensed from attending classes due to my condition, I drew up a sketch of the work for the Immaculate and sent it to the Father General. He gave his blessing and expressed the desire that it be propagated among our young people. The militia will be an association committed to fighting against the Freemasonry and the servants of Lucifer. To think that such a, a tremendously grand project could have its origin in such a humble simplicity is a sign in my mind of the truly spiritual nature of the Militia of the Immaculate. To dedicate oneself to the Immaculate Mother of God is to commit oneself to the mystery of the Incarnation that is really begun in the womb of the Immaculate One. Having finished his studies in philosophy and theology, Maximilian is ordained priest on the 29th of April of 1918. He is ordained in the church of San Andrea de la Valle and chooses to celebrate his first mass in a church with a very special altar, the altar of the miraculous virgin in the church of San Andrea de la Frate. The place where the Immaculate Virgin appeared to the Jewish Alphonsus of Radisbon, completely converting him to the Catholic faith. When Saint Maximilian celebrates his first Mass, he has a long list of intentions. At the end of the list, written in Latin, are these highly significant words, Pro Amorum Usque Ad Victimum, which means love to the point of victimhood love unto the sacrifice of one's life. This intention is like a premonition of the martyrdom, the self-giving that would consummate his love-driven life at the end of his days. 
al final de sus días. I wish you to take possession of me as soon as possible and in the most perfect way and that I too may possess you that as soon as possible I be truly yours without limits without conditions irrevocably eternally and you mine When Saint Maximilian speaks of the act of consecration he distinguishes very clearly between the will and the sentiments and he explains that the act of consecration of self-giving may often be accompanied by dryness or by coldness but he insists greatly that consecration the giving of oneself to the virgin mary to the immaculate is an act of the will he calls it an act of the will by which one gives oneself to the virgin and which is never revoked that is enough and when young people approached him to ask to enter the community the criterion for discernment for him was that they have the decisiveness and the will to consecrate themselves entirely to the immaculate to belong to her to be hers this was for him the criterion for discerning a vocation You say you wish to be a Franciscan. Good. But tell me if you remain firm in your purpose to devote yourself to the Immaculate, if you really desire to consecrate your life to her, to be consumed and ready to end your existence by starvation, disposed for her sake to suffer deprivations and the risk of premature death. Maximilian completes his studies in Rome and his superiors ask him to return to his homeland. Not yet fully recovered, he obtains permission to return to Krakow and in 1922 begins his modest apostolate with the publication of the magazine The Night of the Immaculate. It begins in the form of a few pages of the cheapest paper he could find. It is not a political magazine, rather, it is totally dedicated to the glory of the Immaculate. Do not write anything that the Virgin Mary could not sign. Having made the decision to build a city for the Immaculate, which would be called Neopokola now, he realizes the need to seek land to build on and finds the perfect plot, quite close to Warsaw, it is an enormous plot, the property of a count, Count Lubecki. And Maximilian goes to speak with him, bringing with him a small statue of the Virgin, which he places on the table to act as mediator in the negotiations. And when Count Lubecki asks for a very large sum of money, a price too high for that piece of land, Saint Maximilian is forced to say that he is unable to pay it and he left, leaving the little statue of the Virgin on the Count's table. The Count asked, what do I do with this statue? He answered, just leave it where it is. It was a tactic, of course, and the Count was left looking at the statue every day. Little by little, his heart was stirred by having said no to the Virgin, giving that he was refusing her the land needed to build her a city. In the end, that little statue on the table touched the heart of Count Lubecki until finally he sold to St. Maximilian for a very low price the land needed to build Neopokolano. Neopokolanau is an amazing place, a convent plus a publishing house. Saint Maximilian really was a precursor of the apostolate of the communications media. Saint Maximilian can be defined in one word as a pioneer, a man who in his lifetime understood the need for new paths of evangelization 
and also new paths for the Franciscan way of life. And since all of those who work there are religious, he manages to print the Night of the Immaculate, the newspaper they edit, at the lowest price of all, with the result that the rest of the newspapers begin to accuse him of unfair competition and succeed in prohibiting the sale of his newspaper, the Night of the Immaculate, in public kiosks. What does St. Maximilian do? Well, he creates his own network of distribution kiosks. They even acquire a small airplane in the convent, with which they distribute the newspaper to all the corners of Poland. El periódico a todos los puntos de Polonia. Many young men from all the professions, including engineers, give up everything to dedicate their lives to the Virgin in the city of the Immaculate in Neopokolanau. Many vocations came to Neopokolanau. The word incredible is justifiable. Comparing the numbers to today's statistics, one is rendered speechless. It was the ideal of the Marian life that drew the young men there. In fact, most of the vocations were religious brothers, not priests. This is interesting. They worked for the Immaculate. They felt that impulse to work for the Immaculate. That's how they spend their days and their life, apart from the times of prayer, which were fundamental. St. Maximilian writes, the strength of Neopocala now is prayer. Above all else, prayer. The first thing he does when he founds the city of the Immaculate is to build a solid chapel, very solid. This building is the very first thing. All the rest would follow. On the 1st of September 1939, there are 760 religious and over 150 postulants an unprecedented record. A record because the Virgin moves and touches the hearts of all these men who desire to give their lives to her. Do you speak Japanese? No. Do you have money? No. Then what are you going to do? I will turn to my usual protectors. Pope Pius XI asks for missionaries for the Orient. Father Maximilian feels a great attraction to the missions. He wishes to found another city for the Immaculate in Japan. Saint Maximilian felt this call to the missions in his early youth. It may be said in the form of a fascination with the Orient. And although still weak of health, he obtained the permission of his superiors along with four other Franciscans of his order, conventual Franciscans, to set out for Japan. It's a long way from Poland to Japan, hours and hours by train, by boat. And in these long hours, he does not cease to work. His great ideals are alive in his heart and mind. In other words, he combines those great ideals with daily reality, the little details of the apostolate. When he reaches Japan, his health is still quite weak. He is shaking with fever. Sometimes he has to celebrate Mass with the support of his community brothers. Every morning he gets up with the words, the Immaculate hasn't called me yet. But God will reward his fidelity. And in a short time, the newspaper, The Night of the Immaculate, is published in Japanese. And as well as being distributed in Nagasaki, it will also be distributed in China and will later reach India and even Arabia. Today we publish a Japanese night. We have a printing press. Glory to the Immaculate. In spite of the great success, his religious brothers observe his poor health. His superior finds an excuse to get him to return to Poland. A few months after his return to Poland, he is once again nominated as guardian and father of Neopokolonau. It is very possible that when you received this letter, something may have happened. 
All is in the hands of divine providence. Never forget to love. In 1939, Hitler's tanks crossed the border, sweeping aside the Polish cavalry. It is often forgotten that the Second World War, which begins with the invasion of Poland, is the work not of the Nazis alone, but of the Nazis and communists together. The Nazis invade Poland on one side on the 1st of September, and 15 days later, the communists invade from their side. On the 5th of September, the printing presses of Neapokalanau are stopped by the bombing of nearby Warsaw. My sons, a pitiless combat approaches. I do not know exactly what will happen in Poland, but we must expect the worst. There is no corner in this world that is without the cross. Let us not run away from it. And if necessary, let us take it upon our shoulders and carry it with a good spirit for love of the Immaculate. In February of 1941, Hitler prepares his great offensive against Russia, crushing poor Poland under his feet, while the Russians on the other side, filled the pits of Katyn with Polish officials. On February 17th, the doorkeeper informs Colby that a convoy of vehicles is entering Neapokalanau. He hangs up the telephone and murmurs, Yes, Mary. Colby greeted the soldiers at the threshold. Praise be Jesus Christ. He is sent to prison in Pawiak. On May 28th of 1941, Colby is sent to Auschwitz. His head shaved and clothed in striped rags, he has become prisoner number 16670. After the publication of Mitt Brenner Sorge, Hitler began to imprison Catholics in extermination camps. We know emblematic figures like Edith Stein and St. Maximilian Kobe, but many Catholic priests were exterminated in the camps. In los campos de exterminio. It is known in the camp that he is a priest and so the hardest tasks are reserved for him. The moving of corpses, the collection of ashes in the crematory, the carrying of heavy logs under which he stumbles. A piece of stale black bread constitutes his main meal for the entire day. His companions in the Auschwitz concentration camp testify to his charity, which was truly heroic. And one of the details that prove this charity is related to the matter of food. In a concentration camp, food is scarce, which makes the work much harder, and the cold. Everything is harder when the stomach is empty and hungry. In the midst of this situation, Maximilian Kolbe was able to distribute half of his food with others who were there because they were weaker or were sick. And this gesture of heroic charity profoundly impressed those who were living with him in the same conditions. On the 30th of July, after work, the entire camp is ordered to stand in line. A prisoner from Block 14 has escaped. Block 14 is where Father Maximilian is bunked. At nine o'clock in the evening, everyone received a little soup, except the prisoners of Block 14. At nightfall, the assistant commandant of the camp appears, Carl Fritz of the SS. 
announcing to the prisoners that since the fugitive has still not appeared, as a reprisal, ten of them would be condemned to die of hunger in block number 11. Fritz walked along the lines picking out the victims. Suddenly, Colby steps forward and offers himself in the place of one of the condemned who is sobbing and pleading. He is a Polish family man, Francis Gajobniczek. I am a Catholic Franciscan priest. Todos estaban impresionados. Everyone was stunned by St. Maximilian's act of voluntarily offering to go to the bunker of death. Because Although it is in itself a big gesture to accept death and to be ready to give one's life for someone you don't know, it is also true that this was an extremely hard way to die, to die of hunger and thirst. It is a long, slow agony, a painful calvary, a terrible death, and he knew what he was committing himself to. The fact that he knew this highlights his charity even more. It is the love of Jesus Christ, the love that gives one's own life for those one loves. The condemned men are forced to leave their clothes at the entrance to the bunker and to enter naked. During that slow and painful agony, Colby consoles his companions. He kneels and prays before the corpses of those who die. After 14 days, on the eve of the Assumption, the order was given to finish off the dying prisoners. The agent of death, armed with a syringe, entered the darkness of that bunker-turned-tomb to find only one man alive, Father Maximilian Colby. The executioner approached him, and the syringe did its job. An injection of carbolic acid broke the last thread of life that remained in Father Colby's body. The martyrdom is consummated. Pro amorem usque ad victimam. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. It could seem that the life of St. Maximilian Kolbe had a sad ending, and that the life of a man so generous, so great, so giving, has been swallowed up by the black mouth of ideology, of those political powers that seek to fight against God. As St. Paul says in the letter to the Romans, they try to imprison the truth and injustice. But the power of God, the love of God, the blood of the martyrs always prove to be more powerful than the forces of evil. And far from stamping out that life, it rises anew, producing, like the grain of wheat, new fruits, fruits of holiness, fruits of enthusiasm, fruits of new life, fruits in the form of lives given to God, consecrated to Him. The life of Saint Maximilian is astonishing. Its vitality, its Marian dimension, the complete belonging to the Virgin, the consecration of one's life to her. It goes to show that Marian devotion, when it is authentic, when we truly enter the school of Mary, when we are children of the strong woman who stood at the foot of the cross, she transmits to her children that strength, that generosity, that fidelity unto the gift of oneself, the complete giving of the self. This is what we see in the life of St. Maximilian Kolbe, and he invites us also to renew that consecration, that self-giving, that belonging to Mary, that Marian nerve of steel in our Christian life, so that we say like he did, O oh, Immaculate, 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 I belong to you.